Chapter Eight of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter Eight: Little Slider resists temptation successfully, and I become enslaved. Pompey said I one afternoon while reclining on the sofa in Dobson's drawing room, my leg being not yet sufficiently restored to admit of my going out. Pompey, I've got news for you. To my surprise, my doggy would not answer to that name at all when I used it, though he did so when it was used by Miss Blythe. Dumps, said I in a somewhat injured tone. Ears and tail at once replied. Come now, Punch, I said rather sternly. I'll call you what I please, Punch, Dumps, or Pompey, because you are my dog still, at least as long as your mistress and I live under the same roof. So, sir, if you take the dumps when I call you Pompey, I'll punch your head for you. Evidently, the dog thought this was a very flat jest, for he paid no attention to it whatsoever. Now, dumps, come here and let's be friends. Who do you think is coming to stay with us? To stay all together? You'll never guess. Your old friend and first master, little slider no less think of that dumps wagged his tail vigorously whether at the news or because of pleasure at my brushing the hair off his soft brown eyes and looking into them i cannot tell yes i continued it's quite true this fire will apparently be the making of little slider as well as for you and me for we are all going to live and work together isn't that nice evidently dr mctougall is a trump and so is his friend Dobson, who puts this fine mansion at his disposal until another home can be got ready for us. I was interrupted at this point by an uproarious burst of laughter from the doctor himself, who had entered by the open door unobserved by me. I joined in the laugh against myself, but blushed, nevertheless, for a man does not like, as a rule, to be caught talking earnestly either to himself or to a dumb creature why melon he said sitting down beside me and patting my dog i imagined from your tones as i entered that you were having some serious conversation with my wife no mrs mctougall has not yet returned from her drive i was merely having a chat with dumps i had of late in my lodgings got into a way of thinking aloud as it were while talking to my dog i suppose it was with an unconscious desire to break the silence of my room no doubt no doubt replied the doctor with a touch of sympathy in his tone you must have been rather lonely in that attic of yours and yet do you know i sometimes sigh for the quiet of such an attic perhaps when you've been some months under the same roof with these miniature thunderstorms jack harry job jenny and dolly you'll long to go back to the attic a tremendous thump on the floor overhead followed by a wild uproar sent the doctor upstairs three steps at a stride i sat prudently still till he returned which he did in a few minutes laughing what do you think that was he cried panting only my dolly tumbling off the chest of drawers my babes have many pleasant little games among others cutting off the heads of dreadful traitors is a great favorite they roll up a sheet into a ball for the head then each of them is led in turn to the scaffold which is the top of a chest of drawers one holds the ball against the criminal's shoulders another cuts it off with a wooden knife a basket receives it below then one of them takes it out and holding it aloft shouts behold the head of a traitor it seems that four criminals have been safely decapitated and dolly was being led to the fatal block when she slipped her foot and fell to the ground overturning harry and a chair in her descent that was all not hurt i hope oh no they never get hurt seriously hurt i mean as to black and blue shins scratches cuts and bumps they may be said to exist in a perpetually maimed condition strange said i musingly that they should like to play at such a disagreeable subject disagreeable exclaimed my friend pooh that's nothing you should see them playing at the horrors of the inquisition my poor wife sometimes shudders at the idea that we have been gifted with five monsters of cruelty 
but any one can see with half an eye that it is a fine sense of the propriety of retributive justice that influences them any one who chooses to go and look at the five innocent faces when they are asleep said i laughing can see with a quarter of an eye that you and mrs mctougall are to be congratulated on the nature of your little ones of course we are my dear fellow returned the doctor with enthusiasm but to change the subject has little slider been here to-day not that i know of ah oh, there he is said the doctor as at that instant the doorbell rang there is insolence in the very tone of his ring he has pulled the visitor's bell too and there goes the knocker of all the imps that walk a london street boy is the sentence was cut short by the opening of the door and the entrance of my little protege he had evidently got himself up for the occasion for his shoe black uniform had been well brushed his hands and face severely washed and his hair plastered well down with soap and water come in slider that's your name isn't it said the doctor it is sir robin slider at your service replied the urchin giving me a familiar nod hope your leg ain't so cranky as it was sir getting all square eh i repressed a smile with difficulty as i replied it is much better thank you attend to what dr mctougall has to say to you all serene he replied looking with cool urbanity in the doctor's face fire away you're a shoe-black i see said the doctor that's my profession do you like it well when it's dirty weather with lots of mud and coppers going i does when it's all sunshine and starvation i doesn't my friend mr mellon tells me you're a very good boy little slider looked at me with a solemn reproachful air oh what a whopper he said we both laughed at this come slida said i you must learn to treat us with more respect else i shall have to change my opinion of you very good sir that's your business not mine i was invited here and here i am now what have you got to say to me that's the point can you read and write resumed the doctor certainly not replied the boy with an air of one who had been insulted what do you take me for do you think i'm a genius as can read and write without avin been taught or do you think i'm a monster who was born reading and writing i've had no school to go to nor nobody to put me there i thought the school board looked after you so they does sir but i've been too many for the school boarders then it's your own fault you've not been taught said the doctor somewhat severely not at all returned the urchin with quiet assurance it's the duty of the school boarders to catch me and they can't catch me that's not my fault it's superiority my friend looked at the little creature before him with much surprise after a few seconds contemplation and thought he continued well slider as my friend here says you are a good sort of boy i am bound to believe him though appearances are somewhat against you now i am in want of a smart boy at present to attend the hall door show patients into my consulting room run messages in short make himself generally useful about the house how would such a situation suit you why doctor said the boy ignoring the question how could any boy attend on your all door when it's burnt to ashes we will manage to have another door replied dr mctougall with a forbearing smile meanwhile you could practice on the door of this house but that is not answering my question boy how would you like the place you'd have light work a good salary pleasant society below stairs and a blue uniform in short i'd make a page in buttons of you what about the vittles demanded this remarkable boy of course you'd fare as well as the other servants returned the doctor rather testily for his opinion of my little friend was rapidly falling i could see that to my regret now give me an answer at once he continued sharply would you like to come not by no manner of means replied slider promptly 
We both looked at him in amazement. "'Why, Slider, you stupid fella,' said I, "'what possesses you to refuse so good an offer?' "'Dr. Mellon,' he replied, turning on me with a flush of unwanted earnestness, "'do you think I'd be so shabby, so low, so mean, "'as to go and forsake Granny Willis "'for all the light work and good salaries "'and pleasant society and blue uniforms with buttons in London? "'Who'd make her gruel? "'Who'd polish her shoes every morning "'till you could see to shave in em, "'though she don't never put em on? "'Who'd make her bed and light her fires "'and fetch her odd bits of coal? "'And who'd read the news to her and—' "'Why, Slider?' interrupted dr mctougall you said just now that you could not read no more i can sir but i takes in an old newspaper to her every morning and sets myself down by the fire with it before me and pretends to read i invents the news as i go along and you should see that old lady's face and the way her eyes open when i'm a tapin off the murders and the highway robberies and the burglaries and the fires at home and the wars and earthquakes and other scrimmages abroad it do cheer up most wonderful of course i stick in any hod bits of real news i happens to get hold of but i ain't particular apparently not said the doctor laughing well i see it's of no use tempting you to forsake your present position indeed i would not wish you to leave it some day i may find means to have old mrs willis taken better care of and then well we shall see meanwhile i respect your feelings good-bye and give my regards to granny say i'll be over to see her soon stay said i as the boy turned to leave you never told me that one of your names was robin cause it wasn't when i saw you last i only got it a few days ago indeed from whom from granny willis she gave me the name and i likes it and mean to stick by it good afternoon gentlemen ta-ta punch at the word my doggie bounced from under my hand and began to leap joyfully round the boy i say said robin pausing at the door and looking back she's all right i hope getting better who do you mean why the governess in course my young lady oh yes i'm happy to say she is better said the doctor much amused by the anxious look of the face which had hitherto been the quintessence of cool self-possession but she has had a great shake and will have to be sent to the country for change of air when we can venture to move her i confess that i was much surprised but not a little gratified by the very decided manner in which slider avowed his determination to stand fast by the poor old woman in whom i had been led to take so strong an interest hitherto i had felt some uncertainty as to how far i could depend on the boy's affection for mrs willis and his steadiness of purpose now i felt quite sure of him dr mctougall felt as i did in the matter and so did his friend the city man i had half expected that dobson would have laughed at us for what he sometimes styled our softness because he had so much to do with sharpers and sharp practice but i was mistaken he quite agreed with us in our opinion of my little waif and spoke admiringly of those who sought through evil and good report to rescue our city arabs from destruction and dobson did more than speak he gave liberally out of his ample fortune to the good cause that evening just after the gas was lighted while i was lying on the sofa thinking of these things and toying with dump's ears the door opened and mrs mctougall entered with miss blythe leaning on her arm it was the first time she had come down to the drawing-room since her illness she was thin and pale but to my mind more beautiful than ever for her brown eyes seemed to grow larger and more lustrous as they beamed upon me i leaped up sending an agonizing shoot of pain through my leg and hastened to meet her dumps as if jealous of me sprang wildly on before and danced round his mistress in a whirlwind of delight I i'm so glad to see you miss blythe i stammered i had feared the consequences of that terrible night that rude descent you you are better i thank you very much better she replied with a sweet smile 
and how shall I ever express my debt of gratitude to you, Mr. Mellon? She extended her delicate hand. I grasped it, and she shook mine heartily. That shake fixed my fate. No doubt it was the simple and natural expression of a grateful heart for a really important service, but I cared nothing about that. She blushed as I looked at her, and stooped to pat the jealous and impatient dumps. "'Sit here, darling, on this easy chair,' said Mrs. McTougall. "'You know the doctor allows you only a half an hour, or an hour at most, tonight. "'You may be up longer tomorrow. "'There, and you are not to speak much, remember? "'Mr. Mellon, you must address yourself to me. "'Lily is only allowed to listen.' "'Yes, as you truly said, Mr. Mellon,' continued the good lady, who was somewhat garrulous. "'Her descent was rough, and indeed so was mine.' Oh, I shall never forget that rough monster into whose arms you thrust me that awful night. But he was a brave and strong monster, too. He just gathered me up like a bundle of clothes and went crashing down the blazing stair, through fire and smoke, and through bricks and mortar, too. It seemed to me from the noise and shocks. But we came out safe, thank God, and I had not a scratch, though I noticed my monster's hair and beard were on fire, and his face was cut and bleeding. I can't think how he carried me so safely. Ah, the firemen have a knack of doing that sort of thing, said I, speaking to Mrs. McTougall, but looking at Lily Blythe. So I have heard. The brave noble men, said Lily, speaking to Mrs. McTougall, but looking at me. I know not what we conversed about during the remainder of that hour. Whether I talked sense or nonsense, I cannot tell. The only thing I'm quite sure of is that I talked incessantly, enthusiastically, to Mrs. McTougall, but kept my eyes fixed on Lily Blythe all the time. And I know that Lily blushed a good deal and bent her pretty head frequently over her darling Pompey and fondled him to his heart's content. That night, my leg violently resented the treatment it had received. When I slept, I dreamed that I was on the rack and that Miss Blythe, strange to say, was the chief tormentor, while Dumps quietly looked on and laughed, yes, deliberately laughed, at my sufferings. End of chapter 8